she banged her fist on that little coffee table and she said no Hello and welcome to Good is in the Details. I am your host, Gwendolyn Dalski, and I am in D.C. now at the Diverse Lineages of Existentialism with the Simone de Beauvoir Circle. Joining me today is Distinguished Research Professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, Margaret Simons, or we call her Peg. She is the author of Beauvoir and the Second Sex, Feminism, Racism, and the Origins of Existentialism. And you can find that she is part of the seventh volume of the Beauvoir series from the University of Illinois Press. Yeah, that's right. I'm co-editing that. Okay. With Simone de Beauvoir's literary executor and adopted daughter, Sylvie Le Bon de Beauvoir. So exciting. Okay, this is really exciting. So what I want to delve into, you have done a lot of work on Beauvoir. You have the unique history of having met the person you were working on. So I am wondering, you're reading Simone de Beauvoir, and then you meet her. What is your first impression? Take me back to that day. She was so old looking. (laughs) What year was it? It was 72, 1972. I had won a Fulbright grant. I was a graduate student in philosophy at Purdue University in Indiana. Mm -hmm. The only woman in the department. They didn't have any women on the faculty, and they had sort of auxiliary associate women grad students, the wives of male grad students who also were all A undergraduates. They admitted them, but they admitted them as associates. Anyway, so I was the only full grad student who was a woman. And one day, the head of the department said to me, have you thought about getting a Fulbright and doing your dissertation research in Europe? And I said, Uh With who? Habermas in Germany? He looked at me like I was crazy, and he said, no, Simone de Beauvoir in Paris. And I said, is she a philosopher? Oh, wow. <laughs> I, had been, I had been talking about her in all of these philosophy classes, and uh, in totally inappropriate classes, because there were no classes on women in philosophy, so yeah. I would you know, bring her up. Anyway, so we got, in, and um, I was an anti-war leader and women's liberation activist, and I was uh, in, on the mall, you know, leading all these demonstrations and I had to go over to the to the um, international student office the man who ran the office at Purdue he, he was this um, redneck guy with big suspenders and he said honey I don't know what you've been saying out there in the mall but we're gonna get us a Fulbright for Purdue okay <laughs> so I wrote Simone de Beauvoir a letter and attached it to my a copy of my Fulbright grant saying that I wanted to talk about her original theorizing in the second sex. I mean, people just said it was Sartre, as though she was just copying his philosophy. But he was extremely individualist, and she was very kind of communal. She was talking about social reality. Women are oppressed as the other in this social world. Well, he, with Sartre, he didn't even think he had parents when he was, you know, Uh talking and being a nothingness is about this individual consciousness. So that was my proposal. My proposal was to go and meet with her if she'd allow me to and do my dissertation research on how her work in the second sex was original. I wanted to know what, where she drew her ideas from. Uh, I knew she was original, but, and so I thought of Hegel. She sounded a lot like Hegel to me. I was reading some stuff on Hegel from the 30s in France, and it looked to me as though she was quoting it almost in a section, in a, in a chapter on history. Uh, she said, women are the, uh, men are the, uh, are the people who are valued, and uh, even women value them because they are the ones that break new ground. Women repeat in, uh, in their traditional roles. They re- re- they're repetitive activities. It's men that are transcendent, and women value the transcendent. They risk their lives yeah. for values. Women repeat values. I said, okay, that sounds like Hegel to me. So I proposed that, and she instantly sent a letter back with the same language that I required, uh, that the Fulbright Committee required. That, And she said, yes, I'd be willing to meet with you during the academic, you know, academic year, 72, 73, and um, call me when you get to Paris. And I thought, yeah. oh, okay. So I won the grant for Purdue. I got there. A little bit early, and I remember I walked around the block a couple times because I heard she was a stickler for promptness. 
Then I got my courage up and rang the doorbell. Now remember, I'm I'm a hippie, so I have uh, <laughs> farmer boots. I'm in Paris, right? I had farmer boots on and my blue jeans and a plaid shirt that of my dad's that I'd cut down. I know it's crazy, but in a t-shirt in Paris. I'd sold my car. I'd sold, I had been a secretary. I sold some secretary clothes. Yes. I sold some books. Okay, I got there. It's my year to do my dissertation. I got there. I rang the doorbell, and the concierge, those days they had a, an older woman who was sort of the caretaker for a house, would let you in. And she smiled broadly at me and took me over to Beauvoir's door. I knocked on the door, and this this woman answered it. I knew what Beauvoir looked like because I'd seen her pictures. Yeah. They were from the 40s. <laughs> this was the 70s. She opened the door, and she was small. I mean, I'm not huge, but I'm 5'6". She was, you know, came up to my shoulders or something, and she was so gross-looking. I was so young, and she's, <laughs> I'm, I'm much older than she was then. She, she was, you know, in her 60s, and she was a heavy smoker, you know. And she had on... She was totally wrinkled in my eyes, mm -hmm. totally wrinkled. I guess that's how I would look now. <laughs> to totally wrinkled. And she had on bright red lipstick and bright red nail polish. And she yeah. kept kind of holding her nails out to me to admire. You know, I don't know. It's very strange. <laughs> anyway, she welcomed me into her room. Yeah. And I, she, I, I know that she could see that I was shocked at what she looked like. You know, I... And she probably was used to it, you know, people seeing celebrity pictures of somebody from, yeah. you know, 20 years, 30 years earlier. So um, we got in there, and I'm really nervous, and she was really nice, and she was crawling on her hands and knees looking, it's in her uh, studio apartment, and she's looking for something for me. And she said, oh, I, I lost my eyes, I have to get, she meant she needed her glasses in yeah. order to see what she was doing. She was charming. And then we sat down on the sofa thing around a coffee table. I'm on one side and she's on another, you know, corner. And she's chain smoking, blowing smoke in my face. And I'm thinking, why is she nervous? Well, now I, <laughs> now, now I know you're interviewing me, so I feel nervous. So I'm <laughs> and I asked my first question. And that question was, well, Simone de Beauvoir, when I read um, The Second Sex in that chapter on history, and I, I think I see... Um, you know, Kojev's reading of Hegel, that section that I just told you about, yeah. about a man. That sounds like, Koje uh, were you influenced? She banged her fist on that little coffee table, yeah. and she said, no, the only philosophical influence on the second sex was Being a Nothingness by Jean-Paul Sartre. And then she lifted her glasses up to her head, and she fluttered her, uh, her eyelashes at me and said to me, tell me about the women's movement in America. And I thought, F you, lady. I mean, what, what I thought at the beginning was, oh, my God. Yeah. This is my, I sold my car for this. This is my dissertation research. She never, ever, in all of the, I don't know, I must have met with her probably a dozen times. She never would answer any questions about her philosophy in the second sex. Really? Never. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Never. Oh my goodness. I know. So, so <laughs> and there I'm, I was. I'm thinking of some ingenious ways you could tease out. <laughs> you could say. <laughs> so what did I do? Yes, what did you do? <laughs> she gave me this like bibliography of, you know, crap, this all these, you know, secondary source articles and I was struggling with my French. And I would go into a library and try to read these journal articles, and they would start with this elaborate praise, you know, all this BS about. And then they would turn into this personal attack and never get to anything substantial. And yeah. I was wasting my time trying to read all this stuff. And he, that's not what I needed to do for my, my work. I yeah. needed to really get into her ideas. I mean, my, my whole my whole dissertation, it's a philosophy dissertation at yeah. Purdue. I needed to look at the philosophical structures of her work and see how it related to discourse that the guys on my committee could understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't, anyway, so it was a disaster. I came, <laughs> 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 she, she gave me books, she lent me stuff, I'd go see her. The, the next time I went to see her, the second, the second time I saw her, I think it was, um, like a couple months later, she said, we should be able to meet uh, three or four times during the course of the year. 
Yeah. <laughs> I had images of me and Jean Paul and Simone yeah. at, you know, drinking at the bar. You know, it's horrible. <laughs> so the next time I came in, I had, why is she denying? I'm, I've been thinking, why is she denying the originality of her work? That's what I was wondering, yeah. So I'm thinking she's, she's, she herself has the problems of a lack of self-confidence that so many women have, which didn't make any sense because she's yelling at me and she's totally self-confident. Yeah. So I come back into her and I have a series of questions, all assuming that she was struggling with issues of self-confidence in her work. She was furious. Don't you talk to me about the yeah. inferiority complex. And she, you know, she yells this stuff at me. And then, you know, wants to talk about the movement in America or something. Yeah. Because I was at that time involved in it. So then I remember uh, another interview I had, the second or third interview I had with her. I wrote it all out. And I had all these questions. And foolish me. I asked a question. And she gave me a yes or no answer. Every one of the interview questions I had <laughs> uh, invited a yes or no answer. And yes. she would say, no. Next question. <laughs> And I got through the whole questions. I said, but that was my whole, <laughs> that was all I wanted to ask. I need to talk about these. And then she would say, you know, tell me about them. It was a terrible, it was a terrible time. But she made my career. I mean, I, I, because I've outlived so many people, I suppose. It's hard to think of another woman in America in philosophy. I don't think there is anybody, although there are probably people in lit, who, uh, who've worked with her because I was, I don't know, I was in my 20s someplace back then. I mean, I don't know, I was 26. I can't remember how old I was. But I just, she always agreed to meet with me. I finally figured out a way to talk with her. It was very difficult to find commonality. I okay. had to break through all this. So a couple years later, I was home and I was working on my dissertation. I had already gotten a job. And I was trying to finish my dissertation during my first year as a professor. It was ridiculous. And I remember there was a young man, in, a graduate student in the history department at uh, SIU Edwardsville. And I was, you know, arguing with him at some point at some little party at our house. And I started telling him about Beauvoir's distinction in the second sex between socialist feminism and um, liberal feminism in the mm -hmm. uh, 19th century in France. And he questioned it, and I ran upstairs to get my English edition because he didn't speak French, couldn't read it. I came downstairs, and oh, my God, that's gone. The whole distinction, the whole distinction between, I guess, what she called bourgeois feminism and socialist feminism was missing in the English translation of the second sex. I had no idea. So he, the partially, uh, Agent Partially was the translator. He was a biologist and he'd written a, a book on sexual, co he supported coeducation yeah. and he wrote a sexual differentiation. He believed in sort of the complementarity of the sexes, you know, yeah. so he was, uh, but he did not like history. History yeah. was, right. So he just deleted huge amounts from the history. But I didn't know that at the time and I was just flabbergasted. So I started looking. I started really examining it and realized yeah. that he, that I don't know how much, I can't remember, half of one of the history chapters. I mean, like, I suppose maybe a tenth of the book was gone. I can no longer remember the figures. So I, I thought, I wonder what she thinks of that. So the next time I had a meeting with her, uh -huh. so like I said, we met maybe 12 times. She never turned me down. And this was the first question I ever asked her that uh -huh. got her interested. How I was edited out. Okay. I said, "What you know? What's the story of the English translation? Why yeah. is it? Why is it so full of these unindicated deletions? Why is so much of your text missing?" And then I realized uh, I had also I had also discovered that a whole lot of her philosophical language is mistranslated. So there's this crucial distinction in existentialism between animal life and human life. It's always trying. It's difficult to try to figure out what makes humans different from the rest of the animals. And so there's this, um, she describes it as animals are at the level of nature, and humans are the ones that are conscious of themselves and go beyond, uh, go beyond the natural, bring it into, bring it into question. And so 
in uh, being a nothingness, in Sartre's uh, being a nothingness, um, it's called being in itself, that's nature, and being for itself, that's consciousness, that's humans. Be well, when H.M. partially translated being in itself, he said the real nature of man, uh, excuse me, when uh, humans is uh, uh, being for itself, when he translated that, he called it the real nature of man in itself. Oh, okay. So he had exactly the opposite meaning. And if you try to teach that in a philosophy classroom, people will think that it's just sloppy thinking. To confuse the animal with the human is to, to confuse a central claim in existentialism about the uniqueness of yeah. humanity. So I was able to talk to her and ask her about this and I got her on my side the first time I ever asked a question. Mm -hmm. Turns out she was furious about that and wanted me to call up. She'd tell me, you must call Robert Gallimard. I said, wait a minute. Gallimard is the name of the publishing house. And Robert Gall Gallimard is the, he's like the son of the founder or something. You want me mm -hmm. to call this guy? She called. I want you to call him, call him and tell him that Simone de Beauvoir has told you to call him and you must. And so I did and I went <laughs> over to their <laughs> over to their office in Paris, uh -huh. you know, with my blue jeans on. And um, I still dress like that. And he said, he met with me, of course. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, no. He said, it's not possible to have a new translation of The Second Sex because she sold those translation rights. Oh, wow. That was part of the contractual agreement. Yeah. And she, she agreed to that. If they want to do a new translation, an updated translation, that's, of course, their, their prerogative, but it's nothing we can control. I'm wondering, does that, is, is that just with the English translation, or did that happen with other languages as well? A lot of other languages are based off the English translation. Okay. A lot of those translations wow. came off of the English rather uh -huh. than the French. It, it took... It took, gee, was 20, 30 years to get this new translations. I mean, my, my art, I, I, so I published an article. It was called, I was trying to put it in Ms. Magazine. Ms. Ms. Magazine had just started up in the 70s, so mm -hmm. it was an exciting, exciting moment, Gloria Steinem. And I was trying to write something, and so I called it um, The Silencing of Simone de Beauvoir, Guess What's Missing from the Second Sex. Oh, that's a great title. I thought it was good, and I almost <laughs> got it into Ms. You know, uh -huh. I, I really tried to, I really tried to highlight the things that were shocking about it. It didn't make it into Ms. It was just, it didn't have enough of a journalistic hook. You know, they needed the okay. right. So anyway, but it went into Women's Studies International Forum in England, and that's eventually I, I, I was uh, one of the co-founders of Hypatia, this journal of uh, yeah. feminist philosophy, and that's how originally. Um, that was published. It was published as special issues in Women's Studies International Forum. That was a uh -huh. kind of a nice, you know, development that I was able to uh, get to know those people, and we developed a, a relationship later. But it took, it actually, the new translation finally came from the foreign rights editor at Gallimar uh, working with a young woman at the British publisher okay. of the English edition of The Second Sex, and they were using the same American translation that everybody else did in English edition, and they decided that, uh, I suppose it was Knopf in, in Britain, decided yeah. that they were going to put out a new translation. Oh, good. Okay. I remember that. Wasn't that a few, that was a few years ago. They were, I think 2010, and so yeah. last night there was a talk at the big plenary with um, Sheila and Connie, who were the translators, and uh -huh. um, it's been uh, been a wonderful thing. Now, the the, ir the irony for me as a as a personal story is that I retired just as that new translation uh -huh. came out, so I never was able to teach that new translation. So it, it's this, it's this wonderful legacy for the, yeah. the, this new generations that are coming along that you can use this use this translation. I never. In all the interviews I had with Beauvoir, I never got through to her. We never connected on anything other than the translation. Uh, she always uh -huh. denied 
that she was a philosopher and yes. took and, and said that Sartre was the philosopher. She, I, I felt like I could turn around like a recording. Philosopher, Sartre was the philosopher. I am a literary writer, so of course I could not influence his philosophy, but he did not influence my literary writing. Yeah. Beep. Sartre was a philosopher. You know, I, it, was, it was horrible. It was didn't, horrible. Didn't, don't her diaries suggest before she ever met him that these there were these philosophical underpinnings there in her work? They do. So I felt when she died in 86, I felt as though um, and her, her daughter, Sylvie Le Bon de Beauvoir, donated many of her diaries and letters to the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris mm -hmm. um, as a part of the inheritance. When I learned that, the, that she had done that, that they, and they were giving us this sort of insight into her life that she did not give to me personally in our conversations or to anybody, um, I felt as though it was something that she left for us. And honestly, I felt like it's what I've come to see in all these years since her death. It's a puzzle. Yeah. Why did she lie? <laughs> Why didn't she talk to me about her philosophy? I mean, when she said that the only philosophical influence on the second sex was Being a Nothingness by Jean-Paul Sartre, that was so, like, false. Yeah. To stare at me in my face and lie like that just ignited this fury in me and this incredible question and a determination to figure it out. So it's only, it's only in the last couple of years that I have finally figured out why she lied. Oh, do tell. <laughs> it's only in the last couple of years. I, she, I mean, I was wondering if it was just part, part and parcel of being in context that many thinkers, even when they are presenting something new, when we're reading their stuff, we still have to appreciate that they are still in a context. And that's what I was wondering if that's what was it. happening with Beauvoir. That's it. I was so focused on myself. Me. Mm -hmm. Why did she lie to me? Why did she? And Michelle Ledoff also, she refused to entertain the questions like this from Michelle Ledoff. Uh, who's my age in France? We were similar in, in confront. We were confronting her. She was confronting us with this wall. She, you know, wouldn't yeah. uh, wouldn't let us do it. So, I, it, I the problem was exactly as you said. I was thinking just of me. Why was she lying to me? It really it was only a couple of years ago that I suddenly realized. Oh my God! Of course, she wasn't lying to me. She didn't write her memoirs, which is where all this lying started. Yeah. She didn't write her memoirs for me. She wrote them in 1958 for the generation of women of the 50s. Yes. And then she took to her grave the the truth. That she she never backed away from the version that she wrote in the 50s. And then uh, the first volume was in 58 of her. It was called Memoirs of a Dutiful Daughter, an enormous success and brought all yeah. kinds of women into uh, a feminist, I don't know if it'd be always of overtly feminist politics, but it was a support for equality and for sexual freedom. I had no idea that, that Beauvoir was a leader in a sexual liberation movement in mm -hmm. France. I had no idea. She and Gide, Henri Gide, were seen as, during the horrible 50s, the very conservative 50s, were seen as the leaders of of sexual liberation. I had no, I mean, we think in, in America, it was like, I don't know, Playboy or something. It was very, yeah. very sexist. Um, but in France, the leader was, uh, Beauvoir was seen as a leader and uh, along with Jean. So I started thinking, what in the world would have made her write her memoirs like that in the 50s. So I started reading all of this stuff that she wrote after the war and I saw an incredible political engagement. Mm -hmm. So she was, she wrote that after the war, the, the people who were in the liberation came out of it in, uh, the, it was a leftist movement, and they were in charge politically. It was our turn to carry the torch, she said. Mm -hmm. And the war had overturned all her ideas and given her a sense of solidarity she'd never had before. But then she never really talks about that solidarity in her memoirs. She just says she got it. And I'm thinking, 
Okay, let's see. So that's the war. That So by 45, 46, well, she publishes The Second Sex in 49. Now, yeah. that's a militant document. And uh, I thought that Toril Moy had this wonderful insight into it. She said, that book was written to appeal not to the ordinary woman, but to all those fellow students of Beauvoir's at that prestigious École Normale Supérieure in Paris. In other words, it was high theory. Yeah. It appealed to me as a philosophy graduate student, but if you look at the response in France, it went over like a lead balloon. I mean, it was, she was attacked, um, it was, she was ignored, she was ridiculed, one thing it did not do mm-hmm. is bring a lot of women into the movement. No one who supported it supported it as feminist. No one was waving the banner of feminism. Uh, Sylvie Chaperon says no, no one espoused feminism in, uh, in, in supporting the second sex. They were talking about the liberalization of sexuality. That's a necessary thing. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So what happened? After that, she become her after forty nine. If you look at the writings from the early fifties, she's very angry and very uh, angry at the the rise of the right and the political conservatives in France. So I'm reading these things she's writing, and I'm taking it's part of the series of the uh, Beauvoir series that you yeah. mentioned. That was the seventh volume. I edited one of the volumes I edited was on her political writings, and I realized, wow, she's got this whole series of political writings through the fifties. Uh-huh. And then there's a book that nobody likes to talk about. That was, I think, it came out in fifty five. And I didn't really like to talk about it myself. It's called The Long March. It's, it's a story of her t- trip to uh, China. She went with Sartre, but she, Sartre doesn't figure into the book at all. It's about her discoveries of, of China and what the Mao's revolution was, was doing. It, this was in the early idealistic years of the Chinese Revolution. Okay. And she was ridiculed at home, remember? Mm-hmm. This is a time when uh, France was fighting to retain control of its colonies, okay. fighting to keep Algeria, yeah. fighting, to keep, fighting to keep its former uh, colonies. And yet she's going to... China, which is one of the poorest countries in the world, economically the poorest countries in the world, and at a time when she's uh, being attacked for suggesting anything about women's liberation in France, a marriage law in China has made spousal marriage the law, dismantling the entire traditional family structure, the patriarchal family structure in China. And I discovered in studying this book, um, by the way, which was very hard to read because I was an old hippie politico. I had a Mao button, okay. you know, when I was an anti-war <laughs> leader. We had a Mao button. Uh-huh. Um, it was very hard to read. Beauvoir scoffing at the critics of Mao's revolution and Mao's policies for threatening famine. Because mm-hmm. only three years later or so, millions of people, something like 30 million Chinese died in a famine. Mm-hmm. So the very risk that she scoffed at turned out to be true. Okay. It's very difficult to read that book. And I think it's one of the reasons that it hasn't been used enough. But I thought, okay, uh, it was the early idealistic years of the revolution. Yeah. No one knew that that was going to, she, she went there. Can you imagine how she must have felt to get to a country just infused with revolutionary idealism and, and to, to completely getting rid of the patriarchal family system? She mm-hmm. was astonished. And I suddenly realized, I found this long discussion of the role of popular literature in the revolution and its role in bringing the population into the, a revolutionary spirit to overcome the 
the control of the elder generation on the young people, forcing them into arranged marriages that were really financial yeah. dealings between, you know, families. Yeah. And she had, in her memoirs, talks about her love for her cousin Jacques. Yes. And how he was at the end, he was in a wealthy family, and at the mm -hmm. end was in an arranged marriage yeah. and married a, a wealthy woman. Years later, we learn he died an alcoholic. And mm -hmm. uh, it was very hard for her to see that that happened in her family. She, in that, she highlights that. And she also highlights uh, the, the, the biggest uh, tragedy in her memoirs that she talks about is her, is her best friend Zaza from childhood, yes. who dies in the midst of a struggle with her mother over an arranged marriage. Mm -hmm. She wants to marry a fellow student of Beauvoir's whose name was Maurice Merleau-Ponty. <laughs> there's a pseudonym in the memoirs, but mm -hmm. um, she wants to marry Merleau-Ponty, and uh, it's absolutely forbidden. And um, Beauvoir doesn't know the truth about why that marriage didn't happen until after her book is published, and Merleau-Ponty sends her a letter and explains. She doesn't know the truth of why Zaza and Marilyn Ponty didn't marry. She uh, blames it all on the on the Catholic Church, on the control of the m the mother's control yeah. of the daughter and the the patriarchal system. Actually, what happened was uh, that um, he was a Catholic boy, and of course that seemed very acceptable. But they were wealthy families. Saza's parents hired a private detective, of course, to to research his family because that they didn't know about him wow. and they discovered that he his um his um, mother had a well-known uh, liaison with a, a a ship's captain or something i can't remember who exactly he was yes. that uh, an affair that so he was i think the product of a uh, of this um illicit relationship oh. that was a scandal and um had mirlo ponti's stood up to that and insisted, and Zaza and Mirlopanti insisted on marrying, it would have meant that his older sister's chance of marrying were just nil. So he was unable oh, wow. to, he, he felt because of his loyalty to his family and especially to his sister, yeah. that exposing that story would have would have been too destructive to his sister's life and to his family. Oh, so wow. he, so he didn't do that. He, yeah. you know, he, he, he refused to do that. And the but Zaza didn't tell Beauvoir. No yeah. one told her. It was Marilyn Ponty told her after the book. So her anger at Marilyn Ponty is intense, and you can see it on this attack on Marilyn Ponty mm -hmm. and the pseudo sartrisma and this yeah. article that she wrote just before her memoirs. You can see the anger she's got at Marilyn Ponty. But in the context of the of her memoirs, it is the battle to uh, marry for love. A battle against an arranged marriage that's really just a a, um, a monetary agreement, a contract, yeah. between, and that's what it was in China. It was all designed for the wealth of the family and to make good marriages. And so I I understood I understood by the time I was done analyzing the her book, The Long March, I understood that. It's possible, it's uh -huh. possible that she realized that she could have her life story become the kind of vehicle to reach women, young women, and she describes as the young women who do not yet dare to dare, that they are so dependent on church and family mm -hmm. that they can't risk everything. She said she wanted to reach them with a message of anger and courage and rebellion. Well, I think Memoirs of a Dutiful Daughter yeah. continues to reach people that way. In fact, Sylvie Chaperon writes that the uh, uh, um, she's a feminist historian in France, intellectual historian. She uh, says that Beauvoir was a figure of ridicule in the early 50s. By 1964, that's the second, third volume of her, she was, uh -huh. she was one of the most admired women in France. Wow. A huge shift. Yes. And 
Marine Rouge, uh, a graduate student now in France who was working with um, Sylvie Chaperon, works on the reception of um, Beauvoir's work around the country, around the world. And there's a letter from a woman in, in uh, Brazil that's typical of people responding to her memoirs. And it says, you have come down off your pedestal. In your memoirs, you are no longer intellectually so far above us that we cannot reach you. Now you have come and we can see who you uh, are. Yeah. So the, the hard part for me to realize is that wasn't really who she was. Yeah. When she painted the picture of herself in the memoirs, she did what she says later in, a, in another context. She said, our political com our political commitment was so great that we even gave up values so central to us, talking about her and Sartre, as authenticity. Mm -hmm. She was not authentically herself in those memoirs. That's why wow. I think she says, I'm more present. My friends say uh -huh. that they can see me more in my novels than they yeah. can in my wow. memoirs. You know what I'm thinking about? It, later in the conference, I'm talking about The Woman Destroyed, and I'm thinking about the format of the diary entry. And Monique, flat out, she, she writes in the diary entry, I, this is not the truth. Does <laughs> she? She made me think about Does what she? you're saying. And she talks about the masks. And I've been really? so fascinated by this diary format that when we pick up that short or that novella the woman destroyed we realize we are not actually getting a story we are getting a point of view of events and the way in which monique understands those events is actually reflecting her character and i'm also thinking now from from talking with you from listening to you about simone de beauvoir's memoirs that those in themselves grab a part of her that she that she chose to remember and chose to publish, but we're not reading that and getting Simone de Beauvoir the person. We're getting Simone de Beauvoir the person at that moment who chose to, I guess, put to paper an aspect of her life, what we, what she wanted for us to see. Yes. And you raise another question, though, that really gets me and it's hard for me to answer, uh -huh. and that is I'm basing so much of this on her diaries. Yeah. And what you just said. Oh, no. <laughs> right? What <laughs> you just said. Monique's right? You right? You, you talked about Monique lying in her diaries. Yes. Yes. So that's, I mean, am I saying that this is a kind of absolute truth in these diaries that I'm looking at? I mean, it's a real, it's a real challenge. Yeah. Uh, we're not, we're not talking absolute truth here. We're talking, you know, an effort to, read against the grain of her writing or put all of her writings together yeah. with her life. One time I see her saying to me in one of those early interviews where we argued and she just got so mad at me, she said, have you read my book, The Long March? What did you think of that? And I thought, what? That stupid book? I said, <clears throat> I don't know. Yeah, it's <laughs> fine. Well, people have been critical. Yeah, well, whatever. That was, uh, now I look back, I can see her asking me that. And my, yeah. you know, sort of, whoops, gulp, I haven't really, you know, worked on that one. I can see her asking me that and, and thinking she's giving me a hint that I, huh. I, couldn't, I couldn't deal with at the time. But now it resonates with me. You know, I, I, when I was writing that paper, the paper that I just, the, the argument that I just gave you, there's mm -hmm. a couple more lines in the argument, is a paper I just presented in Paris last year in mm -hmm. October, and it was it got a very interesting reception in France. In other words, that she was writing her memoir. This is on the occasion of the Pleiad edition of the memoirs, mm -hmm. this a prestigious um, bound ed edition of the of the memoirs all together in one. Uh, I, maybe it's two volumes. And um, Sylvie Le Bon de Beauvoir has written an, a, a beautiful accompanying book, a little book of a biography with uh, photographs absolutely charming just for that fad edition so it's a, it's a lovely lovely edition so here i am talking about the memoirs that have just come out in this edition with in and i'm saying that it was a political it was motivated 
shaped, it was shaped by her political commitment. And later I realized she's very involved as a Maoist. Why in the world did she, did she write those papers in the, in the 60s? Uh, like she did an, an expose of a factory fire where women were horribly injured, these uh, uh, women factory workers, these young women, and the factory owner was trying to get off and there was a trial and they were trying to get some compensation. Horrible. It was for a Maoist paper, you know, and she then she defended the, the, the paper and the streets. And I thought, where did this Maoist stuff come from? And now and people say, oh, well, she was following Sartre. But now if you read The Long March, you don't see Sartre there at all. That was a moment of her own uh, struggle with what is political commitment to a writer in a conservative era. Okay. What can a writer do? The, the most popular, important, the, the best-selling novel ever in China, I think, was a, a novel from the 30s that was a semi-autobiographical about a young man in a very traditional family in the countryside whose uh, grandparents controlled the marriages and forced the older son to marry for, um, you know, family for money. The younger son is falls in love with this uh, girl who uh, runs away, and they go off. It's not until the older son's wife in the arranged marriage dies uh, in a tragic way in the family uh, that he then is able to rebel against the control of the grandparents. And no novel Beauvoir writes ever ignited the kind of rebellion and desire for change and anger as that book did and i'm okay. thinking boy that theme that theme yeah. oh is it cousins and that's like her and jacques were cousins in the ah. range of marriages you know that that theme is it is so central the other uh, another theme that she was interested in was what you call gradualism when the cadres when mao's cadres first got into the countryside mm -hmm. to change the marriage laws they forced men to give up their concubines now you might think well that's a feminist thing to do well those women had no means of support okay. they killed themselves on mass and they just i mean not together but they what were they going to do? They were thrown out of their house. They okay. had no way, no means of support. They died. So what happens is the people in the countryside killed the cadres. So these these Red Army wow. cadres were killed by the people. And the lesson that they learned at the time was that you need to go slowly and incorporate elements of the traditional culture into a gradual process of change so that you do not alienate the population so that you bring them with you and I thought my god that's the memoirs she yeah. highlighted the traditional elements like she had sexual relationships with women gone she was yeah. a rival she was a rival in, with Sartre she had enormous intellectual ambition yeah. she saw herself as a philosopher you can see in her diaries that's not something she's faking she skipped a year in her advanced studies and Sartre flunked the exam so he was three years and older than her and they <laughs> they split the difference and got together the yeah. one year when he was repeating an exam and she skipped a year and was taking the exam that yeah. year I mean she was enormously ambitious she's she there's this quote I love from her uh, diary she said <clears throat> seems like I I uh, got Sartre was mad today when I <laughs> compared him with somebody she said and you know, I really broke loose today. I'm getting the best of Sartre today. But boy, we're having fun and really learning stuff, too. And then I realized a few pages later in her diary, it wasn't so much fun for Sartre. He's saying she's not so amusing when she talks about philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had heard that one of the reasons why some of her work, that there are quotes of other writers, of course, all throughout her work, and that some of it might, there might be a word off here and there, and that's because she was doing it all from oh, memory. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She was doing it because she read so much, then when she oh, sat she's down incredible. to write, she's she just incredible. did it from memory. Yeah, she had one of those. She's an extraordinary yeah, person. She was, I, I, think it was I think it was practically a photographing memory. The problem is, because she relied always on her memory she would get things wrong so uh, lovely Barbara Claw who's been doing these translations yeah. of the of the diary has just done an incredible job annotating them trying to find the source of the quotes and you know she'll 
she'll find the not quite they're not yeah. quite accurate so it, uh, that's right she's can you imagine? I know. Can you I, imagine? It's, it's, it's really strange. Well, that's what, what I'm thinking when you say how she, uh, you know, in person is crediting Sartre, but then when you look at any of her work, I mean, she is absolutely extraordinary. Hours in the library, teaching, reading all the time. And from memory, her yeah. students say that she never consulted a note and would just lecture <laughs> and lecture and lecture. But uh. that's can I? Well, I wanted to ask you when you come from a, a unique place, having met Beauvoir, having done all of this writing, when you come to these conferences, what comes to your mind? Was there something new or you come to these conferences and you think, oh, I, this is exciting to see a new generation talking about Simone de Beauvoir or maybe I hadn't, maybe somebody does a reading of Simone de Beauvoir in a different way. I think I take my cue from Heraclitus here. You can't step in the same river twice. <laughs> and I think it's the same way with reading a text. Yeah. I think that you are never you are never the same person when you're reading it because the context is different or you have a different history. So every time you come back to a text, yeah. it is a new experience. Do you have some of that when you come to these conferences? And well, you look at what you just and- look at what you just said to me a few minutes ago about the uh, woman destroyed in the diary. I mean, I never noticed that before. Okay. I was never, you know, it's not a text I've really worked on much. I have a little bit. And, um. You just made my day. (laughs) 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 You just made it. All right. Okay. And, you know, that really gets to the heart of this, of the difficulty I have, the the difficult position I'm in, Mm -hmm. trying to correct, correct the memoirs. Okay. Based on what? On some absolute text, some absolute truth. Yeah. <laughs> there is no diary now in published in, in publication that is the moment that she wrote the second sex. Tomorrow I'm presenting a paper on I saw the aha moment. Yeah. I got tired of saying aha, so I've kind of turned it's gonna be published and it's gonna be the turning point. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um why did she write the second sex? What made her write the second sex? I, what what gave her the idea of writing the second sex? It's very difficult, and it's like the memoirs. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't have a diary of hers or detailed correspondence for the period when she was writing the second sex, or she's got correspondence with Nelson Algren, and that's helpful, especially about the influence of um, Gunnar Myrdal and Richard Wright on, mm-hmm. on race and the second sex. But in her memoirs, uh, we don't really have a diary that's available. And I'm hoping that if those diaries exist, uh-huh. that they might be published and we could then have insight. In, because this, this period, in the post-war period, the in the 50s, if there are diaries in the 50s, oh my God, that's what we really need. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That sounds great. Yeah, but still, I mean, right now we don't have them, and all I can do is sort of speculate about memoirs. She didn't write it for me. Yeah. She wrote it for those young women who do not yet dare to dare. I love it. That's in a the great... 50s, isn't that nice? Yeah. There was the Beauvoir conference that was was in Israel. I think oh, that you may. Yeah, I think you may have mentioned that you were considering doing your own memoir or something along those lines, or. Is you know, the- I you know I was thinking about that, and um, I so I started getting my all my sort of memorabilia together and thinking about it, and I realized that what I was really interested in is um, this thing we've been talking about now about how I got into this, but because for me, uh, I know I'm endlessly fascinating, <laughs> but. For me, what's most interesting about my life is um, my relationship with Beauvoir and this intellectual history I have. Mm-hmm. So this this whole effort to try to understand her and I mean a lot of people have been hippies and politicos and but it's been a unique opportunity. I will that's what I was wondering is that if you were working on your own, how does that does that process make you look at what the process for Beauvoir must have been like. Oh, you know, that's trying to do it trying to do it yourself and all of a sudden you're thinking, oh, this is I want you know, that's an interesting idea and think about that. I wonder if that's part of the reason when I could I could step back from myself and see her writing her memoirs in the fifties and realize it wasn't for me. I mean yeah. that was that was a really a real 
turning point in my, my work uh-huh. on her is that when I realized she wasn't writing it for me, she was writing it for the women of the 50s. And for me to say, you know, why did she lie to me? I Suddenly I was... I had to see it in context of her life. That's that's interesting. I was I, I there was a time when I was uh, thinking I would write my memoirs too. Okay. Yeah, that is very interesting. So maybe that did help me step back a little bit from her memoirs and my memory of her and look at her response to me in the 70s and see that it was different from what she was doing in the 50s and you know sort of see her work in the context of her own life that's interesting I never thought of it that way I'm going to have a final question for you here do you have a favorite of her novels or of her literature I suppose the one I th- if someone doesn't know anything about her and wants to know what to read I would always say memoirs of a dutiful daughter or okay. I, uh, if something shorter I would say uh, very easy death oh yes don't yes. you think yes um, we translated a short novel of hers a while back called uh, Misunderstanding in Moscow. That is sort I don't of... I know it. Yeah, it's sort of... It's, uh, it was never published. It's like... It's about her and Sartre, basically, in um, Moscow, how their relationship is... Um, what their love relationship is like at that point. What it's like... What, love for people in their 60s, uh, realizing the limitations. Maybe because I'm in my 70s now, it seems very touching. Um, I think it's a beautiful story. So we published it in the volume of her literary writings in the Beauvoir series. It's called, the volume is called The Useless Mouths and Other Literary Writings because um, the first text in that volume is our translation of Bouche and Utile, so Useless Mouths. But I, I think probably... I know Mandarin's is very good, but it's so long. <laughs> that's a real literary endeavor. It you know, is. That's, that's, I, I absolutely love that book. But I think if somebody were to start out with Beauvoir, if they're not a reader, yeah. reader that, that won't do. But I. What about I She know, Came to Stay? Like, there, I, I, I never liked it. <laughs> I, I never liked She Came to Stay until I, I started working on it. And then I thought, holy smokes. And people like it. I mean, there's, yeah. it's the action is drawn by uh, the attraction of a middle-aged woman to this, a very dutiful middle-aged woman, to this spontaneous, sensualist girl. That's the, that's the drama. The drama of the novel is fueled by that desire, that yeah. attraction. It's not exactly desire. Probably it wasn't in real life, but I mean, there's a, uh, and that's very, that's very interesting. I, my first book that I read by her was All Men Are Mortal. Oh, and really? I, yeah. And, and I had actually finished She loved my, that book. I actually finished my master's and I was taking a break between working on my master's and doing my PhD. And I sat down in a cafe and I thought, you know, I've never read anything by Simone de Beauvoir. Who is this woman? And I just picked up All Men Are Mortal. That's just what was at the bookstore. And I got it, and I sat at a cafe, and I thought, my dissertation is changing. Dude! <laughs> I am going to write. Really? Um, I need to write <gasps> on this woman. She would love that story I because still, she loved that book. You know, well, I it think It did not that, go over well, but she loved it. Well, there is a line. I think in everything I've written about Beauvoir, this line ends up in it, and that I have never forgotten when Fosca is trying to... I don't remember the female character's name, but trying to have maybe a marriage proposal or love relationship, and the woman realizes that he does not age and that this is not possible, and he doesn't understand. And the woman says, do you hear that woman out there singing? Isn't it all the more lovely because you know one day she will die? And I have never forgotten that line. I have never, ever forgotten it. It is That made me rethink (laughs) a lot of things and I find myself coming back to that idea in nearly everything that I work on when it comes to Beauvoir wow (laughs) okay we should wrap it up thank you so much for your time this has been such a treat I feel like a very very lucky podcast. you're gonna leave you're gonna leave me with that thought (laughs) yeah I mean because I'm at that age when people are dying no don't say do you know what I mean? Well, it's hard to say. I'm talking to a young person. But at my age, a lot of people die, and I'm losing my family. And there's this, there's this thought of, it's you know, my, my husband was saying to me, look, one of my relatives, um, she's not dead yet. 
You know, yes. there's a there's it, it's cherishing the now, the yes. moment, the yes. relate. So thank you. Yes, thank I you, mean, Gwendolyn. What, okay. <laughs> yes, cherish the moment. That's what we'll take away from this. Thank All you. right. Thank you so much. How does it sound? Sounds gorgeous. 